In this tutorial, we'll start designing a sample RESTful API for our simple social media application. And through the process, we'll understand how RESTful URIs are designed. Note that the next few tutorials are all going to be about design. We will understand what a good API looks like, and we will design the API for our sample application. We will start coding much later. So if you want to get started on the implementation, you can skip these API design tutorials. But remember, an important thing that makes a good REST API is how well it's designed. So in my opinion, understanding REST API design is actually much more important than learning how to actually implement it. So I encourage you to watch these tutorials as well. The app that we are building in this course is going to be called Messenger. It's a social media application similar to Facebook and Twitter and Google Plus and all that, all those apps. Uh, this lets people post messages as status updates. They can also write comments to other messages or like other messages like in Facebook. Users also have user profile information where they can create and update their own profile information. Um, this is a very simple application with a very simple ER diagram. You have a user table with user information and a messages table contains all the messages anyone has ever posted. Uh, of course, each row of the message table refers to the user who posted it. And finally, comments and likes tables, which refer to the message that's being commented or liked. And the user who has entered the comment or hit like is also being referred to in the comments or likes table, right? It's a simple uh, few basic entities which are interrelated. So this is going to be the core of the messenger application. Let's look at what URIs you would design for this application. We want to design RESTful resource-based URIs. So how do we do that? If this were to be a web application, I'm sure you already know what to do. Say you need a page to view a message, right? It takes in a message ID and it displays the message or a post. The URL could be anything of your choice. It could even depend on the framework that you use. Let's say you use struts. So the URI to get, say, a post ID 10 could be something like this, right? Your app context slash get messages dot do question mark ID equals 10. Or it could also be my app slash retrieve messages dot action question mark post ID equals 10. These are perfectly valid URIs. And honestly, when developing web applications, what URI you use doesn't really matter that much because as long as you provide a link to the user to go to that page, they don't really have to remember the URI, right? They just remember the URL to the home page and then they navigate to different pages using links that you've provided, right? So they don't have to worry about the URL and so you don't have to worry about the URL yourself, right? So this is if you're writing a web application. However, if you're writing a REST API, the consumers have to be aware of the URIs. This is because the consumer of your REST API is a developer who has to write code to make these HTTP calls to your URIs, right? So what would really help is to have a common URI convention for different entities so that they don't have to really struggle to find out what URI to use for what, right? This is where the RESTful concept of resource URIs come in. Before I start explaining the best practice for forming these URIs, I should tell you that's exactly what it is. It's best practice. Uh, there's no right or wrong way to create these URIs. But if you're writing a REST API, it's better you follow these best practices to keep both you and your API client from going completely insane. Okay, let's pause for a minute and step back in time to the late 1980s and early 1990s when bright colors were in fashion, not just in clothes, but also in web pages. And you had web pages that look like this. A typical website at that time would likely be a set of static web pages, right? Static HTML web pages. Imagine one such site now. To access the pages of that site, you would enter the URL, which consists of the path to the page and ending with the page name. Okay, so they were static HTML pages which had to be accessed providing the path to the page and ending with the page name dot HTML or something like that. So every page has a unique 
URI that specifically identifies that HTML page, right? So there's a URI which uniquely identifies a specific page. There's no ambiguity here. This is exactly the concept behind resource-based URIs, right? Everything or an entity has a URL that's unique and standard. And I found that the best way to design RESTful URIs, at least start thinking about designing RESTful URIs is to think of them as static pages. Take profile pages on a site like Facebook, for example. When you open an account on Facebook, you get a profile page. That's obviously dynamically generated pages. So whenever there's a new profile, it's basically the same page which does some server-side processing and renders different content depending on the profile that you're watching. But if this were to be static HTML pages, right? Imagine you were designing a site with like four profile pages and you wanted them to be static HTML pages. You don't have the luxury of creating dynamic pages which load different profiles depending on what data is passed. How do you create them if you were static pages? You would, let's say there are four profiles, you would create four HTML pages. You would create one HTML page for each profile and the code in that HTML page would contain information about the profile, right? So the name of the HTML page would very likely be the name of the profile itself. If my profile name is Kashik, the HTML page that I would create for my profile would be Kashik.html, right? Now let's say there are four such uh, profiles, right? Four users for our static web page. Uh, let's say Kashik, Raj, Sid, and Jane. Now I have four static HTML pages, and each page, the name of the file is same as the name of the profile. Now I have a bunch of these profile pages on my site. I wouldn't want to put all of them on in the root directory, right? I wouldn't want every page to sit in the root directory. Since these are profile pages, I'd probably create a profile directory and put them all there, right? So I would create a directory called profiles and all these profile pages go into this profiles directory. So if I had to access my profile, if I had to access kashik.html, my URI would be slash profiles slash kashik.html, right? Now if you drop the .html extension, you have your RESTful URI slash profiles slash Kashik. Again, to make it generic, the URI for any profile pages slash profiles slash the profile name. And there you have it. That's your first RESTful resource-based URI. And this is basically what you have to do when you're designing RESTful URIs. Think of resources and create unique URIs for them. Let's look at some more examples. How about posts or messages? Right? We have the ability to post something, post a message. So what would be the URI for that message? Let's say every message has a unique ID, which obviously would if you're designing a system like this. So you could design a URI that looks like this, slash messages, slash message ID. So the URI slash messages slash one gives you message ID one. If you do a slash 10, gives you message ID 10 and so on. Notice two things with these URIs. First, the URI contains nouns and not verbs. Things in the system like documents or persons or products or accounts, these are all resources. You don't have URIs like get messages or fetch messages. You have just messages, right? When you're designing a RESTful URI, Keep an eye out for any verbs in your URI like this. There typically shouldn't be any. It should be typically just nouns. And typically the nouns are the resource names themselves, like posts or profiles. Again, using the static web example, right? You wouldn't create a directory called get profiles, right? You wouldn't name a directory called fetch messages. The directory name would just be profiles in which you keep all the profile pages or messages in which you keep all the messages pages, right? So that's all there is to the name. It, the URI should be just the noun. It shouldn't have the action. Secondly, notice the resource names are all plural in both the cases. It's not slash message. It is slash messages. And again, this is good practice because it makes it very clear that there are actually multiple messages under the slash messages directory, not just one, okay? So this is the first step 
to designing a RESTful API for any system. You have to identify the things, you have to identify the nouns or the entities in your system. And they become your resources. And now you have to assign resource URIs for each of those resources. The advantage of using such resource-based URIs is that they're not really dependent on the framework. So there's no dot do or dot action in your URIs and no question mark ID equals query parameters. These details are really of no significance to the clients. So there's no reason to have them in your URI. Right? Your client doesn't care whether you're using struts or Spring MVC, it doesn't matter to them. So why have them in the URI, especially in the case of RESTful APIs where the client actually has to mess around with the APIs. They need to know what the URIs are and they need to be able to code that in their, in their own application code. So they don't need all the extra information that they don't really care about. So this resource-based URI makes things simpler. And another thing is it makes it resistant to change. Now, if you change your application design or your technology, let's say you don't use struts anymore, you use Spring MVC, still the URI is the same because it never had any such extra detail in the first place. So nothing changes. You wanna access message ID 20, it's still slash messages slash 20, no matter what framework you use. Now let's look at some of the nouns in our Messenger application. There are comments, likes, shares. Each one can be a resource. Let's start with comments. What would be a good RESTful URI for a comment with ID 20? I want comment ID 20. What would be a URI for that? Well, it could be, based on the model that we've discussed so far, it could be slash comments slash 20, right? This is correct, but there's one more thing we can do. And this has got to do with resource relations. When designing a URI for resources, you'll often encounter this thing. You'll encounter resources that are dependent on other resources. Take the example of messages and comments. Someone posts a message and then someone else comments on the message. And a message can have multiple comments and each comment has its own ID. So it's a one-to-many relationship. I'm sure you're You've seen relationships like this before. So we've designed a URI for messages like this, slash messages, slash message ID. Could the URI for comments be slash comments, slash comment ID? Well, it could, but that treats both messages and comments as two independent resources, and it doesn't acknowledge the relationship between them. Let's say we have two messages, right? Message ID one and two. Message ID one has a bunch of comments, IDs one, two, and three. Message ID two has a bunch of comments, four and five. Now, if I were designing this as a static HTML page, right? Let's say we are designing a static web page. So we have two message pages and we have five common pages. I wouldn't want to create one common comments folder and put comments for all the messages in, in that single folder, right? If I do this, I would lose the relationship information that messages have with comments, right? A comment belongs to a message. And if I put all the comments irrespective of the message into one folder, I lose that relationship. So to convey that relationship, what I could do is create a subfolder for each message, right? So there are two messages. So I create two subfolders. And the comments for message ID one, I put in the first folder and the comments for message ID two, I put in the second folder. If I were to do this, what would be the URI for comment ID two? It would be slash messages, slash one, which is the message ID, slash comments, slash two. Okay. Notice how the message ID is a part of the URI which is then followed by comments, then the comment ID. So the generic URI for any comment would be slash messages, slash message ID, slash comments, slash comment ID. Now, is this URI better than slash comments, slash comment ID, which we saw before? Well, that depends. This URI makes it very clear that a comment belongs to a particular message. So the relationship between resources is very well established. On the other hand, to get a comment, 
you need to know two things. You need to know what the comment ID is, and you also need to know what the message ID is because that's a part of the URI. So this, which approach you take really depends on what you expect the client to know. If you expect the client to know just the comment ID, having the message as the parent resource is gonna make it tricky. So they have to find out what the message ID is to access any comment ID. But on the other hand, if you know that the client always knows the message ID when they're accessing a comment, you can use this URI because this requires a message ID. This structure can be applied to other related resources too. For example, messages can be shared or liked and each like has a unique ID, each share has a unique ID. So a URI for a like could be the same message ID URI slash likes slash like ID. Similarly, URI for a share could be the same message ID URI slash shares slash share ID. So typically when there's a one to many relationship, you choose to have the one side of the relationship be the root resource and then the resource on the many side that follows it. Okay, so how about many to many? How about one to one? Let's set that aside for now. We will revisit these relationships a bit later. But for now, let's limit ourselves to one to many. So we'll summarize. So what are the resources in our system? We have all these resources, we have identified it, and we've identified the resource URIs for each. Here we are treating profiles and messages as first level entities and comments, likes, and shares as second level entities in relation to messages. Now you might be wondering why messages are not related to profiles. Why are they both first level entities? Because if you think about it, messages are posted by somebody with a profile, right? So there is a one to many relationship between profiles and messages. Couldn't you have message URIs like this? Profiles slash profile ID slash messages slash message ID. You could, but in this case, I decided to have them as separate. I decided to have the message independent of the profiles because I felt that they weren't as tightly coupled together as like messages or comments were. I didn't expect the client to know who the message author is when they're accessing a message. I want them to be able to say, I have a message ID, now give me this message without having to know who the author is, right? The profile ID. Again, this is something that depends and you have to think about this on a case by case basis. Now, I hope the concept of resource based URIs makes sense now. Another important factor you need to think about is collection URIs, which is a separate concept that we're going to talk about in the next tutorial. But before that, take the exercises and try out some resource URIs. And I'll see you in the next tutorial. Thanks for watching.